Today on Cook's Country, Bridget shows Chris how to make the ultimate chicken nuggets at home. Then, Jack challenges Chris to a tasting of yellow mustard. Next, Adam reveals his top picks for broiler-safe cooking dishes. And finally, Julia uncovers the secrets to perfect tomato mac and cheese. That's all right here on Cook's Country. Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen is brought to you by DCS by Fisher and Peichel. America's cooks rely on innovation and culinary precision. DCS by Fisher and Peichel, offering premium indoor and outdoor kitchen appliances. Chef's Catalog, offering kitchen products for home chefs and cooking enthusiasts. Online at chefscatalog.com. And by Valley Fig Growers, offering a fruitful array of California figs. Fast foods have been around at least 2,000 years. In fact, I was at Pompeii a couple years ago, and they have fast food stands. These were counters with big clay pots inset so they would keep warm. And you just go by for lunch, for example, and get a bowl of stew. In fact, even emperors like to eat fast food in Rome, so they've been around a long time. Here in America in 1872, the lunch wagon was born in Providence, Rhode Island. That was one of the fast foods. In the late 1800s, there was Harvey houses. These were in New Mexico. When trains stopped at a station with a couple hundred passengers, Harvey Housers could feed 200 people in 20 minutes or less and get them out. That was fast food. The first drive through was the pig stand in Texas in 1921. Of course, McDonald's in 1953. Now, there's no question that Chicken McNuggets were a huge success, but McDonald's had a few McFlops, too. Have you heard of the Hula Burger? You probably heard of the McLean Deluxe that actually used seaweed. How about the McAfrica, or my favorite, the McLobster? And a local critic once said it looked like someone threw up on a bun. It was also six bucks. So let's go into the test kitchen with Bridget. Let's take the concept of chicken McNuggets, but let's make it entirely from scratch. And hopefully it won't be another McFlop. All right, so are you ready for the chicken McNugget quiz? Sure. You're gonna win something really great. Am I? Is there an ingredient in Chicken McNugget which is flammable in large quantity? Uh, I'm hoping no. Yes, the answer is yes. Is there, yes, is there an ingredient in Chicken McNuggets which is derived from something in the petroleum industry? Hmm, well, Just I'll, keep I'll have to say yes. Yeah, you can yeah, get how this okay. works, okay. Is there an ingredient where you actually ingested one gram of the pure ingredient would cause nausea, delirium, and complete collapse? <gasps> No. <laughs> You're not good at these things. <laughs> the answer is yes to all of these things. Really? No, I just should say that everything in Chicken McNuggets is FDA approved in the quantities they're used. There's nothing unsafe about them, but just the notion that some of these things in larger quantities are things that I personally probably don't want to ingest, even though they're perfectly safe. So that's why we're here for you to do homemade chicken nuggets. Yeah, I, you can worry okay. all about the what goes in it. Would you like one? No, yeah, not okay. at this time. What I'm more worried about, because I'm a cook, is I want to come up with a great recipe for homemade nuggets. And that's why we're here today, okay? So I've got here my boneless, skinless chicken breast. This is one and a half pounds. Now, we want to cut these into evenly sized pieces for nuggets. And that's actually more difficult than it may sound, because take this chicken breast here. You've got a thicker part. You've got a thinner part. So just working with one breast at a time, just want to cut it on a bias into three equal pieces. This is the thickest part of the chicken breast. I'm gonna turn it so that this cut side is facing towards me. And I'm just gonna cut it into about half inch pieces, straight across, just like that. These other two pieces, which are much thinner. So in order to get them one and a half inches thick, I'm going to go to bias this way. So now we have chicken pieces that are all the same size, see? Very clever. So you're going to all this geometric hassle so you don't have pieces different sizes so they cook at a different rate. That's right. I assume. That's exactly right. As I mentioned before, this is boneless, skinless chicken breast. It really doesn't have a lot of flavor, and it doesn't hold on to moisture very well. There's not a lot of fat in there. So we're going to solve that by brining. So if you come on over here, I'm just going to show you my quick brining solution. Brining corner? Yes, brining corner. I've got two cups of water and a tablespoon of salt. This is just regular salt, table salt. Now, instead of just using all salt to brine the chicken, we're going to use Worcestershire sauce in addition. This is two tablespoons. But the Worcestershire sauce is also going to give it a lot of really deep, meaty flavor. Easy. Bring this over here. I'm going to submerge all these nugget pieces right in there. I'm going to put a piece of plastic right on top. It's going to go into the refrigerator for just 30 minutes. All 
right, so chicken nuggets are obviously out of the brine. I drained them a little bit earlier. Now I'm just gonna pat them dry because we want our coating to adhere. Now we were looking for a very specific coating. We wanted it to have a lot of crunch, a lot of flavor, and be easy to make. This is a cup of flour, just all-purpose flour. And we don't want to use just flour. We want some substantial crunch. So this is panko breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. This is a cup of those breadcrumbs. I've got a teaspoon of regular table salt and two teaspoons of onion powder. Three quarter teaspoons of black pepper. And now your favorite, a half a teaspoon of garlic powder. Oh, you're using all this stuff from the pantry <laughs> from the 50s. Great, that's what I grew up with. This is a half a teaspoon of baking soda. So I'm just gonna mix these together. Now we need something to help this adhere to the chicken. This is three egg whites. Now we didn't like the coatings that had egg yolk in them. That little bit of fat actually prevented the coating from sticking to the chicken, and it also made it a little bit too doughy. So this would be a sample of a coating that had Thank you fat very in much. It? Yep, those are doughy chicken nugget balls, I think. So we didn't like those. We didn't okay. like that. And then this <clears throat> is the other coating that we came across a lot. This is just a breadcrumb coating. It wasn't substantial enough, and as you can see, it really doesn't stick to the chicken. Right. Just want to whisk this together so there aren't any strings of egg white. All right, so I'm going to take about half of these at a time and into the egg white they go. Make sure they're well coated. And then into the crumb and flour mixture. So now, just going to toss these around, get them well coated. Right over there is our honey mustard sauce. The ingredients that go into it is honey and mustard. <laughs> this is the perfect recipe for me. No, it has two other ingredients, salt and pepper. That's exactly okay, right. Okay, so it's got salt four ingredients. Pepper. Very easy. That's a third yeah. cup of honey. Okay. And just mix with that, that half a cup of yellow mustard. So just mix that together and then you can add salt and pepper to taste. Okay. We do have two other sauces that we also offer. We do. We have a sweet and sour sauce. We have a barbecue sauce. Mm -hmm. and you can get those online at our website, cookscountrytv.com. Now, we're not going to start frying these immediately. In fact, we want to let them sit about 10 minutes. What's going to happen during that time is some of those juices from the chicken are going to kind of eke out and blend with the flour and form a paste. We also don't want to throw away all this crumb coating because we're going to use it in just a few minutes as well. All right, Chris, 10 minutes. These chicken nuggets have rested. It's time to you, fry them. You look so happy. You're about to fry something. You know why? I have yeah. a big pot of hot oil here. This is four cups of vegetable, or you can use peanut oil okay. here. And we brought it up to a temperature of 350, and we are ready to go. This is our leftover crumb coating. What I'm going to do is just put all this chicken right back in there. And that gummy coating is going to pick up even mm. more of this new coating. Makes for an extra crispy, mm. crunchy coating. So I'm going to put in half of the chicken at a time. In it goes. Now these are gonna cook super quick, just about three minutes. All right, so I can see from that beautiful brown color that this batch is just about done. Look at that. I know, I know, okay. <laughs> okay, they look good. In order to keep these warm, I'm gonna pop them into a 200 degree oven while the oil is reheating to 350 degrees. And they can just stay in there until we're done with the second batch. So in goes the rest of our twice crumb coated chicken nuggets. So just a couple more minutes, Chris, with this batch, and then we're gonna be eating some nuggets. How and about I'm that? I'm gonna tell you how good they are, I bet. Yeah. <laughs> I bet. I bet. These look beautiful. You want more compliments upon, compliment upon compliment. I do, I'm needy. They're beautiful, they do look great. And this is a finger food, so I'm just gonna tuck right in there. They're very crispy on the mm -hmm. outside. It's a light. Mm. I can't believe you forced me to eat homemade nuggets, and I love them. So the secret to our chicken nuggets started with a brine, which also used Worcestershire sauce. And then we used a coating of flour and panko breadcrumbs, which we crushed a little bit. And the other secret ingredient in the coating was a little bit of baking soda, which causes browning. And finally, for the liquid part of the coating, we used egg whites. So I thought this was going to be an unhappy meal, but it turned out to be a very happy meal. We have a great recipe here from Coast Country for homemade chicken nuggets. They're fabulous. Good.
you know, I, people come up to me on the street and always say they want my job, but they don't remember this part of my job. So, it's mustard not, tastings. Yes, it's yes. yellow mustard. It's Even yellow. worse. Well, you know, but since you're always complaining about, you don't like spice, about everything. Yeah. About spicy things, I've done yellow mustards, which are really quite different than other mustards. Yellow mustard is made from yellow mustard seed, as opposed to Dijon mustards, Chinese mustards are made with brown mustard seeds. And besides being a color difference, there's a flavor difference. It's really a different flavor profile than a Dijon or an English style or German style mustard. And it is an American invention. Uh, it was first put on hot dogs at the St. Louis Fair in 1904. Something to be thinking about is the intensity of the mustard flavor. Yes, they don't have a lot of nasal heat, but we like the brands that had more mustard flavor. Uh, some of them seemed very salty. Um, this was actually a taste test where the brands with more salt performed worse. Some of them have a lot of vinegar, like that one. Yeah, and well, that's part of the stabilizing and preservative effect of the vinegar, along with the bracing acidity. And you should remember, you don't really eat mustard this way. You know, it's on a fatty hot you dog. You could have given me four hot dogs, at least, you know. I mean, come on. Give me I, a break. I wanted you to be able to have the, the best shot at getting it right by tasting them as is, Chris. I think these two are, this one in particular, very vinegary, much overpowering amount of vinegar. Okay. So I don't like that. There were some brands like where the mustard wasn't really the first ingredient, and we thought the, the higher up the mustard is on the ingredient list, no surprise, the better it tastes. It has more mustard flavor. This is clearly my favorite. I mean, it really tastes like mustard. It's got some nice heat. This is too vinegary, those two. This is probably the winner. I'll just try that again. <laughs> He's always worried that I'm tricking him in some way. What? <laughs> Jack and I have worked together for 22 years, and every year you trick me. So come on, I mean, it's like, I'm not stupid. I would pick this one. All right, and uh, the rest of them? I just like that one. It's the only one I like. Well, I have good news for you. You chose some horrible thing. Uh, Dijon mustard rather oh. than the yellow mustard. Yes. <laughs> Was I right about the tricking part here? I know, he does have reasons to be suspicious. All right, now I should say, I didn't trick the nice audience and didn't give them Dijon mustard. They chose uh, the winner, uh, which was the winner of the tasting panel back at the America's Test Kitchen, and it was the Annie's. It was the clear favorite of the audience, clear favorite of our tasting panel. We thought among the yellow mustards had the most personality, the most mustard flavor. This was really particularly bad. Um, well, this was sort of middle of the pack. This is the number one brand, and a lot of people who chose this chose it because this is, in their head, what yellow mustard tastes like. And this was um, the absolute loser. This is an organic brand, and funny, it had the most salt and got the fewest votes. So the answer is, if you want to buy a great yellow mustard, buy Dijon, because <laughs> it tastes much better than yellow mustard. But if you have to buy yellow, I guess the winner was Annie's Natural Organic Yellow Mustard. Trick me again. Now, one thing we know is that Kraft did not invent mac and cheese. That goes all the way back to Jefferson. Here's his recipe. Boil macaroni in milk for 10 minutes, take it out, add some butter and cheese, and broil it or bake it. That's how he did it. And also, that's how Fanny Farmer did it back in 1896. So there's nothing new in terms of mac and cheese, except for one thing. That's tomato mac and cheese. Now, tomato mac and cheese was made popular by the Automat, by Horn and Hardart. That got started in 1898 in Berlin. That notion was stolen by the Americans. We put it in Philadelphia in 1902 under the Horn and Hardart name. They eventually came to New York before the first war. They were so successful at their height that over 800,000 people a day ate at Horn and Hardart. So why were they successful? Well, if you were an immigrant, for example, and didn't speak great English, you didn't have to order off a menu. You could put the money in the slot and get your food. You didn't have to worry about dress codes. It was the anonymity of the Horn and Hardart Automat that made it successful. In fact, Hopper painted the famous painting Automat, which showed that loneliness. And actually, Marilyn Monroe and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes in 1953, she sang about it. She said, a kiss may be grand, but it don't pay the rental on your humble flat or at the Automat. And Irving Berlin did a review, actually, at an Automat, and the song was called Let's Have Another Cup of Coffee. So I can't bring back Marilyn Monroe, and I can't bring back the Automat, but I can bring back tomato mac and cheese. So let's head into the kitchen with Julia and figure out how to recreate this great American classic. So it's a grand tradition here at Cook's Country when employees have been here over 10 years to get a very special dinner. All right. So I'm taking Julia out to Horn and Hardheart. <laughs> for two minutes. But it's you, have, only. You, you have to bring the quarters. We're going back in time. We're going back in time. <laughs> actually, when I was much younger, there was actually Horn and Hardheart at Park Avenue, 42nd Street. I actually ate there. 
the food behind those little glass panels wasn't great. No. So we're going to take tomato mac and cheese, which is, of course, a famous Horn and Hard Art offering. Yep. Do it right here at Cook's Country and see if we can do it at home and also do it better. That's right. right? So I've already started cooking the macaroni. And again, to cook pasta, you need a big pot, lots of water, four quarts of boiling water, and a good amount of salt. And one of the tricks we found to cooking really good mac and cheese is to undercook the macaroni just a little bit. It's hot. Let me warn this, you. This is a test? Mm-hmm. Al dente. Yeah, so it's okay. a little firm to the bite, and that's perfect. And now we're just going to drain the macaroni. All right, so we're going to put this back on the stove. And it's actually at this point that we're going to start to incorporate the tomato flavor. Now, of course, we tried lots of tomato products. Classic recipes use canned soup. Nice and traditional and brought back nostalgia for most of us. Really sweet and gloppy. Not a lot of tomato flavor. Yeah, there's good nostalgia and bad nostalgia. I don't think we'd be in the latter category. I think you're right. Hey, how about a tomato? Yeah, exactly. We tried a few of those, but they were really quite bland. Tomato paste. I thought that would be a winner. Yeah, you know, it made a lovely rosy pink color for the sauce, but it really didn't have much flavor, and it was okay. a little dull. <clears throat> now we have tomato sauce. That's right, both canned and jarred, and it was just really odd. It was like a mix of spaghetti and mac and cheese. It wasn't right. And then you really try ketchup, now come on, <laughs> really? No, we didn't really think that would work, and of course it doesn't, it it's work. really weird. Save it for the burgers. That's right. Okay. Now what did work was canned diced tomatoes, and a lot of recipes we found only added about half a cup of tomatoes, which lent no flavor to the dish. We went all the way up to a big 28 ounce can, and we're gonna add it right to the pasta. And putting it back over medium low heat, the pasta will really absorb all that tomato liquid and really intensify the flavor. There actually is a tip to take away from here, which is that if you undercook your pasta by a couple minutes, then put it in a skillet or a Dutch oven with the sauce, that sauce will get absorbed into the pasta, which is what's going on here. That's and that's right. a good way to meld the two. That's right. So this is just going to take about five minutes for the pasta to absorb all that tomato flavor and get rid of that extra moisture. So this mixture has been cooking for about five minutes, and you can see that the pasta really has absorbed all of that tomato moisture. Okay. We're going to set this aside when we make our cheese sauce, but we're going to start with a little bit of butter. This is six tablespoons of butter, and we're just going to melt it in this saucepan over medium heat. And there we go. That's all nicely melted. This is half a cup of all-purpose flour, and just a little bit of cayenne, a quarter of a teaspoon. The heat will bloom the cayenne, but also what happens to the flour, it gets coated in that butter and makes a really good thickener for the sauce. And now we're ready to whisk in the liquids. Now this is four cups of half and half. We found it really important not to substitute a leaner liquid like milk because the cheese sauce will really break, especially with the acidity of the tomatoes. We're gonna cut it with just a cup of chicken broth because we needed to make a little more sauce, but we didn't want it to be too okay. dairy heavy. So we're gonna bring this to a simmer and let it cook for about 15 minutes before we add the cheese. So it's been about 15 minutes, and you can see this is really cooked down into quite a nice thick sauce. Now we're gonna pull it off the heat and finish it by adding the cheeses. Now of all the cheeses we tried, we really like the flavor of cheddar the best. And this is four cups of a shredded mild cheddar. And the key to adding the cheese to the sauce is to do it off the heat and to do it a handful at a time and to just whisk it in until it melts. Now to punch up the flavor of the cheddar just a little bit, we're gonna use a sharp cheddar. And this is two cups of sharp cheddar. Oh, doesn't that smell good? The aroma of the melting cheddar. It's a teaspoon of salt and a teaspoon of ground black pepper. Now we're gonna pour this mixture right on top of our macaroni and tomato mixture. And we're gonna stir it all together. I love that rosy pink tint that the tomatoes turn the cheese sauce. Now we're gonna put it into a baking dish and we're gonna bake it for only 15 to 20 minutes. Not only will it help cook the sauce and the pasta together, but also it'll help it set up. We're gonna put it into a hot oven, about 400 degrees. Again, for only 15 to 20 minutes, let it set, and let it get a nice golden top. So now I'm gonna join Adam, who's been testing broiler safe baking dishes. For a cautionary tale from Cook's Country, about five years ago, we baked a casserole in a Pyrex dish, took it out of a very hot oven, put it on the counter where there was a fair amount of water on the counter, and boom, the whole thing exploded, shards of glass everywhere. So we checked into Pyrex, and they said it is not broiler 
safe. So we're going to get rid of this, put it back into the cabinet. And anytime you want to broil, if you have a baking dish, we need some other options. These are seven different broiler safe baking dishes. The price range was $37.50 to a high of $125. These two close to you, the red one and the blue one, are both enameled cast iron. The rest of them are all ceramic. Now, the tests that we did were Boston Baked Scrod, which, contrary to its name, cooks completely under the broiler, and Chantilly Potatoes. You have three casseroles there in front of you. Those are riced potatoes with a broiled layer of cream and cheese on top of them. And basically, all of the pans cooked both dishes just fine. There wasn't an issue there. There was an issue with how they interacted with the testers. Why don't you put on these oven mitts and try and lift up that red pan at the end? That's one of the cast iron enamel uh, cast I bet iron this is going to be heavy. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, that's really. That's super you, heavy. You know what you'd have to do? You'd Terrible. have to open the oven door and give everybody spoons and say, just eat it out of the <laughs> oven. Right? The long spoon. So that doesn't work. The other issue, aside from weight, was whether there were handles and the types of handles. Believe it or not, one of these, obviously, the green one in front of you, has no handles at all. So try lifting no. that one up. No, this is going to end up, look. Somebody sat down in a meeting, a new product meeting, and said, let's design a broiler-safe baking dish with no handles. So you want to have handles. And obviously, not all handles are created equal. For instance, this one just has these little lips here, which help you get a grip, but it doesn't really provide as secure a grip as we want. Why don't you pick up this one with the big, beefy Ooh, handles I like that. there? It's not that heavy. It's not heavy. It's got big handles. That's actually our winner. This is the HIC porcelain lasagna dish. It's got big handles that are easy to grab. It's lightweight at just four to third pounds. And it was $37.50. It's a fabulous broiler safe option to the Pyrex. So say goodbye to Pyrex under the broiler. Spend $37 on the HIC porcelain lasagna dish. It's safe, it's easy to pick up, and it's a winner here at Cook's Country. I always get really chummy with you when you get to the I noticed. The food's ready. You get very I cozy. I close right in. <laughs> so again, this was in the oven for 15 to 20 minutes to let it get that nice golden top. And then I pulled it out and let it cool for about 10, 15 minutes so you wouldn't wreck the roof of your mouth. Let me dive right into the center. Mm. Oh, doesn't that look good and creamy? It makes a mm. great noise coming out to it. It has that real mac and cheese yep. noise. I know it. what you mean. Oh, this looks so good. Oh. Mm. It's creamy and the tomatoes mm. cut through the richness mm. of the dairy and the cheese. This is really good. Mm. The secret to great tomato mac and cheese was not lost, I guess, with the demise of Horn and Hardart. So we started by cooking the pasta al dente a little bit undercooked so the petite diced tomatoes were put into it and really got the flavor of tomato into the pasta. A classic bechamel, we added half and half instead of milk so it wouldn't curdle. And then two kinds of cheddar cheeses, nice fresh cheeses, so they melted well into a hot oven for just a few minutes. Very quick cooking, about 50 minutes, and there you have it. Let it sit before you dig in. You don't burn your mouth. A great recipe for Cook's Country, classic tomato mac and cheese. You can get this recipe, all the recipes from this season by going to our website at cookscountrytv.com. Also find our testings, tastings, and you can watch selected episodes. This is phenomenally good. Oh, I love this rosy mac and cheese. All of today's recipes are just a click away. Visit our website anytime for free access to this season's recipes, taste tests, and equipment ratings, or to watch our current season episodes. Log on to cookscountrytv.com. Best Country Recipes, Cook's Country TV's home recipe companion, includes every recipe, taste test, and equipment rating from this season's shows. With the recipe companion, you will also receive this two-DVD set featuring all 13 episodes from this season. The cost for Best Country Recipes and the two-DVD set is $19.95. To order, call 1-800-888-3384 or order online at cookscountrytv.com. Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen is brought to you by DCS by Fisher and Paykel. America's cooks rely on innovation and culinary precision. DCS by Fisher and Paykel, offering premium indoor and outdoor kitchen appliances. Chef's Catalog, offering kitchen products for home chefs and cooking enthusiasts. Online at chefscatalog.com. And by Valley Fig Growers, offering a fruitful array of California figs. Ready and we don't want to make a McFlop, but we do want to make chicken McDuggets, McDuggets from scratch, yes. We, we do have to taste it. 
Thank you, Chris. <laughs> the idea of no bake, the idea of simply putting someone in the ice, putting someone in the ice box and eating them when they grow up. Yes. We need a minute to just look at. You this. can have your minute. Come on. Mm. Walk mesh strainer. Walk okay. mesh strainer. Walk mesh strainer. Stainless steel wesh mox, the, the wet black strainer. <laughs> Why do I let you do this to me? <laughs>